Good morning and welcome to Courageous Church. If this is your first time watching with us, gathering with us today, we're so glad you're here. We want you to know that you are welcome here, that you are loved, and that you can find true community here. If you're part of the Courageous Church family, welcome. We're glad we're here and we're glad to continue growing with you today. We just finished a series going through the life of Jesus and following Peter's faith journey. Um, and we just finished up Easter where we talked about Jesus's death and his resurrection. Now in this next series, we're going to go straight into the book of Acts, which talks about the birth of the church. The books of Luke and Acts were actually written as a two-part uh, volume to uh, Theophilus, or a lover of God. It was written by Luke, one of the disciples of Jesus. And Luke was this incredible historian, and he, he recorded um, the birth of the church and what the early church looked like, how they became the church um, in great detail and with great power. And I'm so excited for this next series where we get to dig in for a season into what it means to be the church. We are growing as a church body and are, are becoming a church together individually we're becoming the church right because um we are the church and you know i get the question a lot being the pastor of a primarily digital church i get the question a lot of where is your church you know i introduce myself to people and as soon as i say i'm a pastor or you know we started courageous church typically the first question people ask is oh where is that or, you know, they want to know where our location is. And, you know, this isn't a bad question. It's a, it's a pretty natural question to ask. But the reality is, is that the church has a whole lot more to do with people than it does with place. Now, that doesn't mean that we aren't praying and, and talking about um where a gathering place will be someday, what a physical presence in our city will look like. And there's nothing wrong with continuing that conversation, but it does mean that location isn't the main thing. The church is not a building. I think this last year has certainly taught us that. Uh, the church is much more than a building. The reality is, is that you and I are the church. We are the church. But it's easy for us to make the church about different things. Have you noticed that? To make the church um, in our minds a place that we go. Or to make the church more about following a religion something that can easily turn legalistic, where we emphasize truth without grace or trying to go to church in, either in order to fulfill some sort of sense of religious duty, to be a good person or to earn favor with God. There's a lot of people that go to church out of a sense of religion. On the other end, we have relativism where... Um, truth doesn't really matter all that much. Um, where being a Christian, being part of the church has a whole lot to do with grace, but not much to do about truth, about God loves everyone. And like, really there's grace. It doesn't matter how you live. And um, we can fall into a place where the church loses its power um, because everything becomes relative. So the church is not a place we go. The church is not a place um, where we we fulfill re religious obligations. It's not a place for legalism. It's also not a place just to make us feel good. <laughs> the church is you and me following Jesus together. Let's read about the church, about what the church is in Acts chapter two together today. Now we're skipping to Acts chapter two, and I wanna let you know that we're gonna loop back around 
<laughs> to Acts chapter one, actually at the end of this series for Pentecost Sunday, um, about the filling of the Holy Spirit in the believers. We're going to press on that more at the end of the series, and it's going to be great. Um, but today, Acts chapter two, sometimes when we do teaching times together, we're going to dig really deep into a few verses and really dig into the depths and the culture and the meanings in these verses. There's other times where we're going to do more broad teachings where we talk about um, like a book of the Bible or where we talk about a topic and how it's interlaced and woven through all of scripture. And there's other times where we're going to read a large passage of scripture together so that we can see a large picture. And that's what we're going to do today. So today we're going to cover a lot of ground and I want to let you know ahead of time and ask you to just stick with me here as we're going to read some larger sections of scripture today. We're going to be going through the entire chapter two of Acts, but it's going to be a lot of fun. I'm super excited for it. Um, I hope you are too. So let's start in verse one. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So first of all, I want to point out here, that what unified the church, what empowered the church, what the spark that started the church as we know it today was the spirit of God. It was followers of Jesus. And we're going to dig into this more deeply at the end of this series, but it's followers of Jesus seeking God and being filled with the Holy Spirit and being empowered by him. This was the birth of of the church. It's the filling of the Spirit of God, okay? And that's what, what united the church together, what brought about the birth of the church, was the Spirit of God himself. Let's continue in verse 5. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at the sound, the multitude came together. And they were bewildered because each one was hearing him speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own languages the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. Now, the first thing that I want us to notice here is Okay, they, they, they're brought together by the Holy Spirit, right? It was the sound of the Holy Spirit working in the church, working in believers that brought people running, right? Um, and it's every nation that's being reached out to here. It's, it's every nation that's about to become part of the church. So this means the church is to be made up of people of different racial backgrounds than us, of different economic backgrounds than us, of different social or cultural statuses than us. Um, the church is for everyone. Okay, and that's an important theme here. And we see this theme all throughout the book of Acts. As we keep going, we're going to see that at this point, it's Jews from every nation, but we're going to see the heart of this as we continue in the book of Acts, that it's quickly expanded to Gentiles and, and the entire ancient world. Um, so this is every nation. Okay. And also, it's important to notice that some people always mock I mean, the Holy Spirit could be doing this amazing work. I mean, there's a miracle happening here, right? People are hearing um, the gospel proclaimed 
in their own native languages. Everyone's coming together and saying, all these people are from Galilee, and yet all of us from all over the ancient world are hearing the gospel preached in our own native languages. This is a major miracle here. But to some, they, they were going to find a reason to mock, to find a reason to not believe. And those people are always around. So, so church, I just encourage you, as we're becoming the church together, know that there's always some who are going to reject the message. And don't ever allow that to deter you. Okay, so let's continue in verse 14. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words, for these men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day, which would have been like 9 a.m. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves know, this Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For Jesus says, concern, for David says concerning him, I saw the Lord always before me, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope, for you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. Brothers, I may say to you with confidence about the patriarch David that he both died and was buried and his tomb is with us to this day. Being therefore a prophet and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would set one of his descendants on his throne, he foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of the Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that we are all witnesses, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit. He has poured out this that you yourselves are seeing and hearing. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. So Peter, who we just followed his, his story where Jesus said, on this rock, I will build my church. We followed this story um, in our last series. We now see this being fulfilled where Peter stands up and he gives, being filled with the Holy Spirit, gives the very first sermon in the new church, the very first gospel message in the new church, um, saying, you crucified Jesus who did all these works among you, but he's alive, he's the savior, he's the Messiah we were waiting for. And we see him quote the prophet Joel, where he says that men and women will be filled with the Holy Spirit. People who are young and people that are old. In this very beginning birth of the church, there's this emphasized again, the Holy Spirit's gonna be poured out. There's gonna be signs and wonders. There's gonna be miracles. The Holy Spirit is alive and active and he is gonna be active and alive in the spirits of men and women, people who are young and old. And that 
that is going to be his church. Okay, these are things that the church is marked by. I love this so much. I hope you're excited right now. Um, let's look at verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off, everyone whom the Lord calls to himself. And with many other words, he bore witness and continued to exhort them saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So those who received his word were baptized and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. I mean, talk about a good day in the church. 3,000 people were saved and came into relationship with God and were filled with his spirit in one day. And who were these people that made up the early church? They were the people who repented of their sin Right? They recognized that they had done wrong. They repented of their sin. They believed in Jesus and were baptized as a sign of that belief and of the commitment to follow Jesus. And they were gifted with the Holy Spirit. That is what the church is, okay? And if you're not part of the church yet, and you want to be, that's what it means to join the family of Christ right there. That's all it takes. But let's look at how the church practically lived this out. So all of a sudden they go from this group of believers in a room praying, being filled with the Holy Spirit, and now all of a sudden there's over 3,000 of them, okay, that now have to be a church together. They have to be a community. They have to be a family working together, growing together. What does this look like? And this is the part um, I really want to press into today as, as we're becoming the church together and learning what it means to be the church. Let's read verses 42 through 47. And this will finish out uh, our chapter for today. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. Then the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So what were these traits that defined the culture of the early, early church? What, how, how, how were they defined? What did they practically do that made them the church? Okay, they devoted themselves to several things here. To teaching, okay? To time like this right here where they were learning together. They were learning about God's word and growing together. To fellowship and to the, the breaking of bread. Those two are really intertwined there. Um, fellowship in each other's homes where they were getting together, living life together, being a community where they were encouraging each other, breaking bread together, which both means practically eating meals together and taking part in communion together, which Jesus instituted, what we've, which we've talked about, where they would break bread and, and eat it and drink wine and remember Jesus' sacrifice for them on the cross, and to prayers. They prayed for each other, with each other. There were signs and wonders being done. When the Spirit of God is present, signs and wonders happen, okay? When Jesus was in Jerusalem where he said there was like no faith, he couldn't do many signs and wonders there. Like even in a place that was known for its unbelief, Jesus still did some signs and wonders. Like when the Spirit of God is present, miracles happen, 
okay? People are freed from sin and shame, okay? The lives are restored and made new. We see things like healing, like miracles accompany the Spirit of God. And now we don't seek the miracles. That's not our reason for pursuing God. We see that in scripture, that that doesn't end well. We seek God, but part of his presence in our midst is that signs and wonders do happen. But they were together. That was a big part of the early church. They were together. They were in life together and they were marked by generosity. There were people in the book of Acts, we see that were selling their land and giving the proceeds to the church so that anyone who was in need would be taken care of. Everyone was selling their excess possessions and giving to those, giving to the church so that it could be given to everyone who had need. They were marked by generosity. They praised God. They were filled with joy and they had favor. If we're living as a church, there's always gonna be those. Like earlier in this passage, there's always gonna be people who mock. There's always gonna be people who are against the church. But if we're truly living out the love of God, there's gonna be a whole lot of people who that resonates with, who, who are gonna be touched by that and who we're gonna have favor with because we're loving them the way God loves them. People are gonna be drawn to that. And this early church was marked by growth, right? Daily, people were being added to their numbers. And they were just going to continue to multiply throughout the world. God's church is meant to be marked by multiplication, not gathering in a building to just dig deeper together. But it's a church that's designed to go out to multiply. And you, church, you are part of this. If you're a follower of Jesus, you're called to be part of this kind of church. You are the church. You and I are the church. We are the church. The church is not a building. And yes, someday I pray that we'll have a place to gather together in person. But the church is not a building. We are the church. I encourage you to embrace these values. If you want to become part of the church, believe, repent, be baptized, and join our community. And if you're part of the church, take a step to start living like the church. Do something really practical this week. Reach out to someone else in the church and offer to eat with them. Pray together. Take time to discuss what you're learning. Grow together. Commit to be consistently part of this community and be generous when you see one another in need, whether it's in need of of prayer, material possessions, whatever. When you see someone in need in this body, we should take care of each other to the, the best of our abilities. At Courageous Church, our, the way we say this um, is simply bold love, bold truth, bold life. And it's meant to encapsulate these things right here. That we boldly love God and each other. That we boldly believe in the truth of God and proclaim the truth of God. And we boldly live life like Jesus in community with each other. Our heart is to be marked by these things. There's so many things that the church can do, but so much more important is who we are. We are the church, right? The culture here matters. It matters if we are the church in our hearts and that's gonna come out in our actions, okay? Now the early church we see as we go throughout the books of Acts and throughout the New Testament, it didn't always remain like this. The church had a lot of failure, and throughout history, we see that the church has failed a lot of times because it's made up of imperfect people who are growing, who are in the process of healing. We're not perfect, but continually we can do our best in the power of the Holy Spirit to seek to return to this, to press into saying, no, this is going to be our culture. When I feel like being isolated, I'm going to be part of community. When I feel like being stagnant, I'm going to grow and learn. When I feel like turning inward, I'm going to turn outward and give. We are the church. This series is becoming the church. 
What is the church? We are the church. Followers of Jesus, following him together. I am so beyond honored and blessed to be part of the church with you. I'll see you next week.